Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Wethington, director, and I'm with Doug Bruin, the gardens manager at J.C. Ralston Arboretum at NC State University. For those of y'all who are joining us for the first time, uh, we are a research and extension garden, so wide variety of plants, free for everybody to come in. So if you're in the, the Raleigh, Central North Carolina area, we invite you to come visit us. Um, hopefully a lot of you are nearby because we are gonna be talking about our 2021 uh, fall plant sale, which will kick off on October 14th for members. Uh, and on October, help me out. The 13th? No, October 8th. What? I'm sorry, I, I forget my okay. dates. We well, open on- The on sale 7th. on 7th. October 7th, we open the sale to members and October 13th. 13th we open uh, the sale to non-members. We do not ship plants, don't ask us, um, but you can come pick them up. So we're just gonna show a few things. Our, and you can go to our website and find a list. It'll be up there shortly uh, and check back because the list will be added to all the way um, in, through the sale. Um, we'll keep adding plants uh, from our nursery and from other sources. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with a few of the plants from the sale. Doug, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, this is an, one of the many Asian species of ironwood, Carpinus. This is Carpinus um, japonica. And I love Carpinus. They're beautiful, uh, very architecturally um, handsome small trees. Um, and japonica has a gorgeous leaf with these deeply impressed le uh, veins. Um, on a mature plant, the leaves are at least twice the size and it might be the prettiest of all the um, ironwoods, Carpinus japonica. And I might just add to what um, Mark said is that we have a lot of real treasures in the sale uh, this year, and a lot of them are in fairly small numbers, so you don't want to put off going through the catalog and ordering them. Yeah, if you're not a member and you look at the list and think you'd like something, you may very well um, want to, to join. So uh, our next plant is a boxwood. This is um, Buxus sempervirens, Aurea pendula. Um, that name Aurea pendula means, you know, gold, weeping gold or gold weeping is the Latin for that. It's a really old um, selection that's been grown in Europe for years and years and years and in the US. It's not really very weeping, but you know, where normally a boxwood is very dense and tight, this is kind of open and, a little bit sprawling, so it makes a really nice architectural uh, form. Um, boxwoods are often utilized poorly in the landscape, um, especially down here, down south, where they're put out in front of a house in blazing, blazing sun, um, where really they, they're great in shade and they will tolerate dry shade once they're established. So a plant like this that grows upright, kind of open and graceful, Put into a, a shade garden really adds a lot of impact there and year round because it is an evergreen plant. Um, and that's the same is true for mother boxwoods. If you move them out of uh, the full blazing sun where it really stresses them out and they're susceptible to more root issues, insects like leaf miners, diseases, when you get them in some shade, they really, really perform uh, much better. So this is one that you can kind of let go or you can prune it to get really a, a really beautiful architectural shape. Anything we've had to a, add to that? We've had oh. a request in the chat to um, be sure to add some uh, comments about mature size and light requirements. And I know you got the light requirements on that one. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I, I'm not sure of its ultimate height. After many years, some of the biggest plants in the arboretum have gotten certainly five feet tall, maybe almost six feet tall, but it's slow. This plant was probably rooted uh, two or three summers ago. Um, 2019. Once, yeah, uh, once established, um, I'm sure it'll grow um, more quickly than it does in its early years. Yeah, I've seen some old ones in uh, European gardens and they can get to be 12 uh, feet tall, but boxwoods are great for, for pruning. Okay. Um, I hope you all have visited the Ralston Arboretum in uh, very early spring when the best shorneria um, blooms. Um, people often are not comfortable with plants' um, scientific names, and this one has a 
real doozy of a name. The genus is Beshornaria. I'm sure after a family named Beshorn or Beshorner and Septentrionalis, and I can't tell you what that means, but it's a close rel relative of yuccas. It makes a rosette of, you know, maybe almost three feet wide, evergreen rosette. And it's absolutely spectacular in bloom. Um, a tall spike of flowers like a yucca, but the stem is bright red, gets about five, six feet tall when it's in bloom. And it, the stem arches over and it has hundred or several hundred small red and green pendant flowers. And it's showy for probably close to two months or so. Um, it's a plant for sun and good drainage. Well, I, I say sun, it's often suggested that it will tolerate very light shade as well. But winter hardy here in zone 7B. Yeah, gorgeous plant. Okay. Um, uh, a favorite group of plants of mine are the the uh, spike tails, as they're sometimes called. More often with people who grow these are just Stachyurus, which is the genus name. Uh, Stachyurus praecox, praecox meaning early. Um, this makes, and this is one called sterling silver, which has this these white edged kind of silvery washed uh, leaves. Really um, striking plant. Uh, great for shade gardens, although it will tolerate quite a bit of sun. It makes a broad arching tree, shrub, somewhere in between there. And uh, in the, um, going into winter, uh, and these probably by next year will do this. Maybe you actually have a few little flower buds, but they'll form these little um, uh, flower panicles in, in all of the, the leaf axles all the way along. It'll drop its leaves. You'll have these little tight, little um, green, uh, 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 little um, gross there for the, the flowers and they'll elongate uh, as it opens up in late winter coming into early spring and they'll be just just long about maybe on this four to six inch uh, uh, racemes of these little pale yellow uh, uh, flowers. Really a gorgeous plant when it starts getting big and it's in full flower it looks like a big uh, you know 70s bead curtain. Um, really really striking plant and the, the plain green one is, is striking. Uh, this one, you know, you get the, that variegated leaf all, um, all summer long as well. Um, there are many variegated selections of Stachyurus praecox. I think this is the prettiest of them all. This is a high favorite of mine and the Stachyurus are one of my favorite um, winter blooming plants. So they don't bloom until late winter, almost early spring, but a real gem in the garden. All right. You have a preference? Uh, I probably could speak better about this plant than okay. the begonia. Um, this is uh, Dysperopsis, Dysperopsis um, undulata. The Dysperopsis are commonly referred to as evergreen um, Solomon seal. And you see they do resemble in growth habit a Solomon seal and they are evergreen. So it's a great plant for shade. This is exhibiting probably close to its full height. These blue black berries would have been preceded by uh, usually white flowers at each pair of leaves. Um, they are spreading plants, modest rate of growth, um, but it can be used as a small scale uh, ground cover in, in a uh, shaded garden. Really um, elegant plant year round. Yeah, and I grow this this plant. This is a wild collection from Dan Hinckley, and I grow this plant in my garden. And yeah, it's got the flowers are kind of greenish white, but but really quite nice. And it does um, it looks great. And I'll usually leave this up all winter. And if you you can see all the growth that's coming out, and if it starts to look a little rough, you just cut that back as the new growth is coming up, and it'll look fresh and clean. But a lot of winters, it looks it still looks just fine. It's a really good one. This is another um, wild collection from Dan Hinckley, uh, formerly of a, a director of Heronswood uh, Garden and Nursery. Uh, he's emeritus director now, but uh, he also has uh, a nursery at his home, Windcliff, and they're great plants. He just won't ship them to you. Uh, you have to 
go out to Washington State to get them. Uh, this is a begonia that I've grown for a long time from, from uh, Dan and from other people. Uh, it was, in, we cut off the leaves, the leaves were cut off for shipping, but it's, it's putting up new leaves. This is begonia emaensis. It grows on sacred uh, Imeishan, one of the five sacred mountains of, of China, along with some other um, begonias. It makes, uh, it'll grow to about, oh, two feet tall or so, pretty large leaves, really nice kind of, uh, uh, you know, apple-y, you know, Granny Smith apple green um, foliage, has pink flowers. Uh, the pink flowers aren't held really well outside the foliage, so it can be a little bit, they can get a little bit lost, but just for foliage alone, um, it's it's great uh, in my garden. I, I really like this plant. Um, and uh, this uh, begonia uh, imeensis, uh, this collection especially, has proven to be very, very hardy for us. It, uh, I, I've grown it for easily, um, a decade, uh, and it's 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 always been an easy plant for me. Uh, like all begonias, it's really easy to to propagate. Um, so once you have it, you can you can um, do some cutting on there. Come to one of our propagation workshops, and you can uh, you can learn about it, uh, how to do that. But easy plant, really showy, um, great. I would have no concerns about planting this begonia really in the fall. Um, most of the hardy begonias are marginally hardy, and I, I prefer to plant them in the spring. If you want to hedge your bets, the plants we have are pretty much all big enough that you could divide them. You can put a, bring, a little piece inside, set it on a windowsill, put the other in the garden, and if you have a really cold winter, you'll have a backup to put out. Um, uh, really, and that's because we have some really nice sized plants that that we're selling. Uh, light to, you know, re, you know, full shade for for these plants and a my, well well drained um, but moist soil. Got a preference? Want to talk um, about both of them? Oh sure. We'll, um, we'll just yeah, Rhodia japonica, the sacred lily. Is that its common name? I, I, I don't know anybody who uses the common name. We all know these as rhodias. Uh, they're a lot like an Aspidistra, an evergreen herbaceous perennial for the shade garden. Um, you know, the typical form is unvarigated solid green leaf. Uh, they're not showy in bloom, but they do produce clusters of fruit which turn red um, any time now and red all winter, so they're fairly showy. This is a really handsome cultivar. It's a Fuji no Yuki with a very tailored white margin to the leaf. Um, there are so many variegated forms, but just for simple, elegantly variegated, that might be the best. And one of the most vigorous growers and, you know. And this is a, a, another cultivar, Gunjaku. Um, it's starting off small, but it will in time when it settles in be more about this size. Um, its variegation is more irregular. Some leaves are, have somewhat of a white margin and others are sort of streaked with white through the width of the leaf blade. But really easy um, shade garden plants, um, hardy into zone six. Um, and though I always hate to say so something isn't eaten by deer, but I've never known deer to eat rhodia, though I can hear somebody in the audience saying they eat it in my garden. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And we may have more rhodia showing up in the sale, so um, you know, be on the lookout. Um, this is a cool little plant. Um, it's one that really uh, shouldn't necessarily exist, uh, we, we thought. This is a, a red bud. It's called uh, Wavecrest, Circus Wavecrest, and it gets that name Wavecrest uh, from the garden and nursery where, where it was uh, found. This is a hybrid between our native Circus canadensis, the, the American Eastern red bud, and uh, Circus chinensis, which is more of a, a shrubby Asian species. It has uh, fairly thick uh, leaves, um, coming from that, that cross. Typical 
lavender pink uh, flowers in early spring before the leaves. Um, just been really impressed with this, this plant so far and I uh, can't say enough good things about it. It looks like it's gonna be, have a smaller stature. Um, so you could grow it more like the, the uh, Chinese form as a multi-stem shrub, or you could prune it off down low, kind of stake it up and give it a little bit of a trunk, maybe a foot, two feet, three feet, and then let it branch from there. And then you get kind of a smaller tree. Um, but I think it's gonna max out no matter how you grow it. At, I shouldn't say max out. It is probably in, you know, 10 years uh, going to be in the um, 8 to 12 foot range. Sun to, to part shade. Okay. Is that on? Yeah, we have a number of uh, pomegranates in the sale. This is a purple heart. Um, some pomegranates are grown as ornamentals, and I believe all of the ones that are grown as ornamentals have double flowers, and those generally don't set any fruit. But purple heart is one that is, uh, does produce a uh, usable fruit in the house. Um, these are nice, young, vigorous plants, probably a few years before they bear any fruit, but um, they grow rather quickly once they get in the ground. Um, more sun, the better with uh, pomegranates and most fruiting plants. Um, they're fairly drought tolerant. Um, you want to avoid a wet site, but just any average soil with average drainage would suit it. Yeah. Okay. You, know, you want to do that? You know, you're good with oh, herbaceous, or okay. I can, whichever. Well, there's, I think we have several different epimediums up yeah. here. Um, epimediums, another uh, excellent herbaceous perennial for shade, even dry shade. Um, this is Epimedium Davidii, um, probably named for Father David, who was a um, preacher in uh, China who also did a lot of botanizing. Um, it, um, epimediums can either be evergreen or deciduous. This is an evergreen species, though with probably all of the evergreen ones, you want to cut the old foliage off by late winter before it starts putting up new growth. Um, it is evergreen, but the foliage will die away on its own when it puts up new growth in the spring. Um, this species is, has bright yellow flowers and it blooms for an extended period of time. For It'll go on for quite a few months. So maybe never a showstopper, but most of the ones that are showstoppers in bloom are in bloom for a few weeks. This will have uh, beautiful yellow flowers um, for many months. Yeah, awesome plant. Okay, um, this is, uh, in my mind, maybe an unfortunately named gardenia. Um, gardenia jasminoides. Uh, you can see it's really nice form with, with showy flowers. This is one called Prince Charles. Uh, which I don't think of any beautiful, uh, yeah, when I think of Prince Charles, I don't necessarily um, think of uh, beautiful, fragrant flowers. Although Prince Charles is a fantastic gardener, he's an avid, avid gardener. It's also uh, being sold in the trade uh, as steady as she goes, which again, I don't quite get that for a gardenia either, but it is the kind of gardenia you love. It is intensely fragrant, um, this, this form, Prince Charles, or Steady As She Goes, whichever um, you want to call it, has really nice foliage. Uh, it's a good uh, cold tolerant plant. If you've grown or heard of Crown Jewel, which has really been one of the best uh, gardenia in recent years, um, it, that was bred here locally in, in North Carolina. Uh, and this is um, kind of the next generation. I guess Crown Jewel, Prince Charles is what they were going for, but Harry or William would have been better probably. Um, you know, like all gardenias, uh, you want to put it in a spot it likes. Um, <laughs> sometimes I don't know what that is, but no, it, you want a, a good sun. Uh, a little afternoon shade doesn't hurt, but isn't necessary, I guess. Um, you want it 
good, moist, well-drained, acidic soils, um, not great in really heavy clay, uh, amend your beds, um, but uh, put it in the right spot and it will be happy. And this, it, the reason they call it steady as she goes is because it does um, put out just successive blooms on it uh, once it's, it really gets going. You can see I have open blooms here. We've got buds that are getting ready to open and you probably can't see, but we have more buds all over here that, um, that wanna open. Uh, so you have this growing um, during the season in the garden, it'll start earlier and you'll really keep getting a flush of flowers. And man, it only needs one flower to, to scent you know, half the garden. You have, you have better advice on gardenias than me. I, I struggle with those sometimes. Um, I've always ended up living where there's already gardenias. So, <laughs> um, I, and I've you know I've seen them growing in full sun and also uh, where they're shaded all day, but not dark shade, sort of bright shade, and they seem to do equally well. And as far as whether or not deer like them, some seem to get eaten, but most tend not to be eaten. You want to do, do another oh, epimedium? Sure, sure. Do you, um, I will, but I don't know if you know anything about this particular yeah, one. Yeah, I can talk about this one. Okay. It's a real gem, especially the undersides of the leaf. Yeah, so this is uh, epimedium ogusui. Uh, uh, Mr. Ogisu uh, is a, a Japanese um, botanist, uh, taxonomist, horticulturist. Um, he's really considered a na almost a national treasure. National treasure is an actual thing in Japan, but he is uh, just one of the most knowledgeable people about traditional Japanese plants, like all the, the rhodia cultivars and aspidistra, but also on the wild plants of Japan and China. I mean, he is encyclopedic. And this was an epimedium that he discovered uh, and was named after him, uh, epimedium Ogusui. You can see the backs of those leaves, uh, hopefully you can see that, are bright white. Uh, this is another of the um, ep evergreen species, uh, like uh, Doug mentioned. And with epimediums, I kind of consider them either deciduous or ones that you wish were deciduous, mm. um, really. Because uh, they do usually look pretty rough by the end of winter and you kind of forget about them. And then by the time I notice them, flowers are already coming up and you either have to trim the, these stems around the flowers. So I've gotten better about, you know, in January, I cut them all back. Um, it's a little earlier than you have to, but but I do that. This is another, uh, this is not uh, uh, Mr. Ogisu's collection. This is a, a wild collection made by Dan Hinckley, uh, but it was collected where, uh, the type location was that the, the original collection from uh, Mr. Gisu was made. So it's, um, it, it'll be uh, very similar uh, to that. I should mention what it actually looks like. It has white flowers, has really nice um, small white flowers, but it's got a really nice kind of thick textured dark green leaf. And so the flowers come, if you've cut it back, the flowers come up uh, and the leaves are coming up, and so you get a really good contrast um, with those flowers and, and leaves at the same time. Same cultural requirements as Doug talked about. Okay. This is um, Pittosporum tobira, a spring bouquet. This time of year, um, the foliage is more green than, uh, well, here it is yellow, so um, in late winter, early spring, when it's putting up new growth, the previous year's growth is all green and the new growth comes out almost pure white. It's solid, almost white, it's sort of pale, pale cream. Um, so it's really amazing in the spring because you'll have that white foliage with the background of the beautiful, dark, glossy, mature foliage. Um, uh, Pittosporum are one of the plants that have the common name of mock orange, because the small white flowers are very fragrant. This is a plant that's happy either in uh, sun or shade. Um, now, this one with white foliage, I probably wouldn't put out in a spot where it's in the blazing sun all day, but you know, where it has some uh, protection from the heat of the day would probably be better um, for one that's you know, almost white when it comes out. And that's one of the nice variegated ones, those 
virescent types that start white and become green. Um, a lot of variegated trees and shrubs, as they get older, sometimes the variegation isn't as showy. That's when the bigger the plant gets, you've got more of that dark green, but all that new growth comes out and it's, um, you know, just covered white. It is spectacular. All right. One of the most uh, popular, I'll put this in between Doug and I, one of the most popular uh, Trends in trees for designers and folks like that are fastigiate or upright trees. Uh, you know, a lot of people like them, um, you know, if they're in co like commercial type uh, situations because you can plant them out and they don't, you know, trees don't, uh, excuse me, cars and trucks don't hit them because the branches all go up. They'll fit into small spaces. I like them because I plant too many things at my house and I can plant more of them if they are narrow. Uh, so Cornus Cusa um, is the, the, one of the Asian dogwoods. It's got beautiful white flowers like our North American, um, Eastern North American native uh, flowering dogwood, but it flowers later than our dogwood after the foliage comes out. So you get these beautiful white um, bracted uh, flowers after on top of this this uh, green foliage, and instead of kind of having the rounded uh, uh, bracts like our native, they're long and pointy. I actually find it a much easier and more satisfying garden plant than our native one usually is. I love our native one, and I love seeing it in the woods, and uh, it's gorgeous. But I just I just have better luck with with this form. So you have the white, the, the beautiful flowers, and then it'll be followed by kind of, um, you know, I don't know, large jawbreaker size uh, fruits that'll turn orange red. This snow tower stays nice and narrow. Uh, so it's very much a, an upright, uh, narrow plant. With time, it'll get to 20, 25 feet tall, and it'll, it'll open up some as it gets older, but the branches will always really be going up before arching out. So it can get to the point where it's, you know, uh, six or eight feet wide as it, as it gets bigger. Grow it in sun or, or part shade. Uh, the more sun it gets, the more flowering uh, you'll get. Uh, you can sometimes, uh, if it's in a real dry spot and it's a real dry uh, season, you can get some, some burn on some of the leaf tips, but um, generally, uh, even with minimal irrigation, it can take uh, take full sun. And these are nice big plants. Um, this is a hybrid deciduous magnolia. Um, it's honey tulip. It's one, um, it's quite new. Uh, we haven't grown it. We only know the um, flowers from um, ca uh, catalog pictures but it's a, a lemon yellow and a nice sort of um, tulip shaped flower. So, and it's also supposed to be a, a smaller growing yellow magnolia because a lot of the yellow magnolias are rather large growing um, coming from one of their wild parents. So we're really excited about this one and we look forward to it developing and, and blooming. Yeah. Um, you know, they can certainly be grown out in full sun and that's probably the best location, but if you had high bright shade, like under some really tall um, southern pines, like loblolly pines, they would do well there as well. Yeah, I, I love these. And, and most of the yellow ones, this one included, are a little bit later blooming, so they miss a lot of the, I should say more of the newer ones. Um, the yellow ones are, are later, so they miss a lot of those spring, um, uh, frosts that knock the flowers back. And, uh, you know, something Doug mentioned about high shade. Um, it's, we don't, we talk about shade like it's this monolithic thing, but one of the, if, whenever I talk to somebody who says they have too much shade to grow a lot of things, I tell them to get the longest pole pruner they can handle. And if you limb up like the pines that we have around here, some of the, the deciduous plants, and you go up uh, as high as you can, um, you know, 12, 18, 24 feet, whatever your pole pruner is, and take off everything you can from your trees. You'll really, it, it will amaze you how much more light you get without getting kind of that real bur intense burning sun. But you can really start moving a lot of these things that people say 
have to have sun, you can start moving those more into the, the woodland area that and way. I'll add um, one other thing about shade from our native pines. Um, it, they're, it's a great location for winter blooming things that are often hurt by a sudden cold spell. Um, I worked in a camellia garden for three years and on frosty winter mornings, it'd be heavy frost out on the lawn and any of the open, the camellias that were open out in the open were destroyed by the night's frost. But the same cultivars under those pines would be untouched by that little bit of protection of the pine needles overhead. Yeah. Um, so our next plant is um, one of the Japanese maples. Uh, one Most Japanese maples that people grow are Acer palmatum, but other maples that are considered that people kind of lump in with those are Acer japonicum and uh, Acer shirasawainum. And this is one Acer shirasawainum um, called Sunny. Uh, and Sunny, as you might expect, has uh, gold leaves uh, during the growing season, especially bright when they come out in the spring. And uh, this is one, I, I haven't grown it, um, and it's supposed to hold its color, even here in the South, pretty uh, well over the, the season without, without burning a whole lot. Some of these golden leaf plants can be a little tricky because in full sun, they can burn if they get really dry in too much shade. They often go green earlier than you'd like them to. But, you know, if you have a spot with some morning sun um, and afternoon shade, that'd probably be ideal for this or some of that high, uh, high shade, it'll really keep, uh, keep these from burning. Um, but the Acer Shirasawainum tend to be a little bit more uh, kind of rounded. I think of them as, as somewhat more dense looking plants than um, a lot of the, the Acer Palmatums. I really like uh, Acer Shirasawainum. I think it's, it's a, a really underutilized species. And um, this is, this, uh, is a, a great addition to what's out there. Um, cast iron plants, you can't have enough cast iron plants if you have a shade garden, especially one that's on the drier side because cast iron plants are very tolerant of dry shade. Um, this is the uh, most widely cultivated species, Aspidistra elatior. This is um, a cultivar, Lordy, I've forgotten. Lenin song. Lenin song. You know, I saw a little bit more striping in it for a moment and I thought it was somebody else. But um, uh, the typical broad green leaf, but this one with the uh, pale, pale green, almost yellow striping in it. They are evergreen through all but the very coldest winters. Um, so they're like having a evergreen hosta that also tolerates dry shade. Um, I wouldn't garden without Aspidistra if I was gardening in a shade garden. And another one of those that are uh, mostly deer, mostly deer will avoid them. You certainly, if you certainly are growing something deer will eat long before that. I've never had issues with, with deer really um, eating those. Um, I love, I love all these plates. Uh, this, <laughs> this is an Inchianthus, uh, not as widely grown here as, uh, as it should be. Some areas of the country, it's, it's more widely uh, grown, but, um, I think, I think they're spectacular plants that deserve wider recognition. So Inchianthus is, uh, in the same family as azaleas and Pieris, uh, blueberries, um, the Heath family. And they like the same conditions as, as a lot of the, as the, the azaleas and rhododendron. Um, you know, some, some shade is preferred, but they'll tolerate full sun actually better than a lot of the, the other Ericaceae. Um, and they want moist, well-drained acidic soils. Mostly around here, we have acidic soils. Uh, you know, you can make your soils uh, well-drained, um, and if you really amend your soils, generally you'll have moist, well-drained soils. It's, it's all about that. This is one called Summer Hill, um, named after where it was, was developed. It has uh, kind of nice uh, red stems for the young stems, uh, really good color. It has 
uh, just an abundance of, of uh, small um, flowers. Uh, Summer Hill is uh, one of the ones with kind of uh, pink veined little urns. If you think of Pieris or blueberry flowers, the little urns, this one will have the, the pink veining in there. Turns absolutely brilliant fall colors. It's one of the best shrubs you can do for, for fall color. Um, in Tokyo, often you'll see these uh, used as clipped hedges, uh, but they're beautiful, just let to grow naturally, but you can trim them back. If you let this grow uh, in 10 years, it can get uh, six to eight feet tall and um, nearly as wide, although it looks very upright now, it'll kind of uh, do this number, but you can really keep them to whatever size you want. You just trim them back right after they finish flowering and it, it won't, they won't miss a beat. It is one of those deciduous shrubs that is very beautiful in the winter because of the architecture of the plant. Mark told you it sort of arches out and sort of like a, you know, thousand branched candelabra, um, really beautiful in the winter as well. Speaking of, okay, there you go. Um, some of the treasures in the plant sale are things we propagated here at the Arboretum. And this is a hybrid evergreen magnolia, uh, Magnolia Eternal Spring. It was bred by the late Dr. Clifford Parks of Camellia Forest Nursery um, in uh, Chapel Hill. Um, it's very much like Magnolia Maudier, except that it blooms intermittently on and off um, most of the year, except for the coldest part of the winter. The flowers are creamy white, close to pure white, maybe about four inches wide and very, very fragrant. Um, it's a real treasure. Um, the plant out there is probably maybe approaching 12 feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what its ultimate size, uh, size is. It's probably new enough that nobody knows. Yeah, and this, like Doug mentioned, you know, this flowers for a very long season. And these, these evergreen magnolias that have Magnolia maudie, which is one of the species um, of magnolias, Maudie blooms, it, it can range depending on the plant and the genetics from, we have some that you often start before De in, in December and some that don't start until February, but they, they flower in the middle of winter. And while they're fantastic plants, they flower for an extended period, they can really get blasted pretty hard by you know, a cold snap. Whereas eternal spring, it's, it is such an extended bloom season that even if, uh, even if you get one of those cold snaps and you know, all the flowers turn brown, there'll be more that are, that are coming out unless you're already at the last bit of flowering. The um, uh, plant of this in the Arboretum is in full sun. I'm sure it does not need full sun all day uh, in order to perform adequately. Okay, this is a plant that really thought was gonna, was gonna um, become more popular than it, it has so far, but we're still, still has time. Um, this is a hydrangea relative, and if you look at it, you might very well think it was a, a hydrangea. Um, and there is some, some taxonomists who might actually lump it in with uh, uh, hydrangea. This is a dicroa, dicroa febrifuga. And the flowers on this are somewhere, they're in little clusters and they're somewhere between uh, the, um, the little fertile flowers in a, a lace cap hydrangea and the larger um, rayed flowers you get around the edge of it. They're, they're about, you know, maybe four times the size of, they can be, what, half an inch or so? Yeah. Half an inch. So they're pretty showy and they're in clusters. Typically they're blue and they don't go to pink really. Um, so typically those are blue and they're very pretty. And so if somebody had said to me, I've got a white flowered form, I would say, well, I'd rather have the blue. The blue is prettier. But actually this one, which is called Yamaguchi white, um, has, has white flowers. They're kind of, um, there's some blue in them, the stamens and a little bit of a flushing of blue in them. But it's actually a much showier plant in the landscape uh, because of that. What really separates dicroa from hydrangea is where hydrangea has a dry fruit. You don't really pay much attention to it unless you're pruning them off to make the shrub look better. Dicroa forms a fleshy fruit that is bright blue. Um, they 
fruiting for a lot of people is not very good. And like a lot of plants, I think it really helps to have different genetics that are, that are pollinating each other. A lot of plants are either self-infertile or mostly self-infertile, or the male parts and the female parts uh, mature at different times, kind of like people. Um, so having more than one type by each other really helps with the fruiting. I have um, four or five different um, selections uh, around my house. So this is Yamaguchi White, selected by uh, Mr. Yamaguchi in Japan, uh, another one of the great plantsmen uh, in, in Japan, uh, Yamaguchi Rare Plant Nursery. Um, we also, in the, the sale, have a, a dichroa, a typical blue flowering one that uh, was from a patch at the South Carolina Botanic Garden in Clemson that was just absolutely covered in fruit when we were there. Uh, those those uh, dichroa uh, from, that we have as heavy fruiting, those we took, intentionally took cuttings off of a bunch of different plants. So those were obviously seedlings that were growing together and that's why we were getting those different genetics. So they're all similar looking, but they should have different genetics if you buy multiples of those. So I really recommend kind of like raspberries or a lot of other fruiting plants for edible fruit that you that you do plant multiples if you really want that fruit. So it could be Yamaguchi white and one of the heavy fruiting ones. Since the heavy fruiting ones have different um, genetics themselves, you could you could buy two or three of those. But I'd really recommend that. But easy plant, um, it's just like just like a hydrangea in terms of how you cultivate it. Um, doesn't want a real dry soil, but you know a little bit of shade is certainly helpful. Mariana's asked about the uh, sun exposure for that one. So uh, the sun exposure for this is uh, is going to be it's it's happiest with a little bit of shade. That high shade, afternoon shade, will be best. Um, it's uh, you know like a hydrangea. If you have it out in full sun in the southern part of of the southeastern part of the U.S., it'll be stressed if it's not getting enough water, and the foliage will actually get much paler in full sun and just not look as lush and, and happy as, as this plant does. And if you have a fever, um, it's one of the most important medicinal plants in Asia. Uh, the scientific name is Dichroa febrifugia. If you have a medical background, a febrifuge is a substance that's used to uh, you know, reduce a fever. Okay, I might need a little help with this. Sure. This is a, a Daphne. It's Daphne transatlantica, Jim's pride. Transatlantica is a hybrid. It looks a lot like um, Daphne caucasicus. Mm -hmm. That's from um, parents. Are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's been a while since I've grown Daphne caucasica, but it was always a fairly long lived and a good performer. I'm guessing this is gonna be white flowered and mm -hmm. bloom for an extended period of time. I'd probably plant it with a fair amount of sun. Um, and that's probably about as far as I'm gonna go. You might have something well, to this add is, to it. Well, this is one, this was actually the first transatlantica form that I grew. And that was uh, 18 or 20 years ago. And um, really it, it blew me away. And I'm, I've always been surprised that that whole group hasn't had more of a, um, a presence. It, it flowers a little later than Daphne Odora, really more going into spring. Uh, heavy flowering, like Doug said, a very extended period. It'll keep flowering for a long time. And, and yeah, I would I would go cl more on the side of full sun than, than shade for this plant and a pretty well-drained soil. But there's a reason, and there have been a lot of these transatlantica um, uh, hybrids. Uh, there's a reason that Jim's Pride was one that I was growing 20 uh, years ago, and it's still one that is um, being sold, where a lot of other ones have dropped out of the market, and that's because this is a really good one. Are they deciduous or partially deciduous? They are. It, it depends on uh, with that hybrid. There are some that are more, they're at least partially deciduous. There are some that are more evergreen, some that are more deciduous. Yeah. I actually remember this being fairly evergreen, but yeah. I was growing it in a little bit 
milder climate. Yeah, it's looking like it's fixing to shed some of these bigger, older leaves, but keep maybe these younger leaves up top. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of evergreen azaleas do that too. They shed yeah. some of the oldest leaves before winter. Happy to talk about this. Um, this is uh, Callistemon, Woodlander's Red. Um, the Callistemons are known as bottle brushes. Uh, along the length of the stem, you'll get this. It really does look like a brilliant red, pure red um, bottle brush. All the floral parts uh, looking very bristly. Um, it's a full sun plant for good drainage, well-drained soils, um, very drought, drought tolerant. Eventually, at least six feet tall and uh, certainly at least that wide. Um, it does have a really big flush of bloom in maybe late spring, but then it'll bloom intermittently now and then through the summer. It is evergreen, lovely narrow leaves add a nice texture to the garden. Um, it, and I would not recommend you do this, but I actually mm -hmm. transplanted some large, fairly large plants at another garden from blazing hot spot to another spot that was full sun, but it was getting, I didn't realize until, until they had been in place for quite a while, it was getting really bad overspray from irrigation for some turf. And it was really, the soil was staying really pretty wet. Wow. And I would have thought it would have killed it. So yeah. it's, don't plant it in a wet spot, but it was surprisingly tolerant of that. It, it really shocked me. I usually don't tell people not to buy something, but I will, if you are red, green, colorblind, you will not see this flower. That's funny. We had a former director who was red, green, colorblind, mm. and he could not, literally could not see the flowers on there because those bottle brush, they don't really mimic the, the, this narrow foliage, but they're held on the stems. And with that, it, he could not see them. You had to really point them out. So if you have red, green, colorblindness, maybe don't plant those. I think the arboretums had more than one colorblind director. Is that right? JC was. JC. And, and Denny. Interesting. Yeah. Speaking of JC, the namesake of our arboretum, this is uh, Liriodendron chinensis JC Ralston. Uh, as you might be able to guess, uh, Liriodendron chinensis is the Asian counterpart to our Liriodendron tulipifera, the, our yellow poplar or tulip tree. Um, I was originally taught that ours was called tulip tree because these leaves looked like tulips. And, and I've heard that repeated multiple times. Really, if you look at the flowers, they're like little uh, yellow, uh, yellowish, uh, yellow green kind of tulips with an orange base on them. Um, it's just they're on a tall shade tree, so people don't look up, but they're, when you see the flower, you can see how closely related they are to magnolias. Um, so Liriodendron chinensis is a bit smaller growing uh, than our native, uh, which means that in, you know, if you give it 50 years, it'll only get to 50 or 60 feet tall instead of 80 or 100 feet tall. Um, but it's actually, it's not nearly as quick a grower, so it, it, it stays a pretty reasonable size for, for a fair amount of time um, and, and will be a just smaller overall presence in the garden. Leaves are much long, larger on uh, Liriodendron and Chinense anyway, but uh, this form was selected for, in part, for its extra large leaves. It was uh, grown out from seed uh, by... Uh, uh, Don Shadow in, uh, in Tennessee, a nurseryman in Tennessee, uh, from, from seed, as I understand, from Barry Yinger, who, uh, another nurseryman and horticulturist. And uh, they got together looking at the block of, of plants and decided to name this one for J.C. Ralston because it was so, uh, it stood out from the others in the, the crowd. Now we grow this at the Arboretum um, and we also grow just the, the, the species Liriodendron chinensis, not the, um, the selection J.C. Ralston. And in 2007, we had a 100-year drought. And since that time, we've had some, some uh, fairly dry summers. And what I have noticed in um, those cases is 
This one keeps its leaves, stays looking good, much better than the other one. The other one, in 2007, are just the straight species we had was pretty much defoliated, uh, dropped all its leaves because of the, um, the drought, whereas this one uh, certainly wasn't happy, but it kept its leaves and just looks really more nicer over the course of, uh, of a, a, a hot and dry summer. Um, beautiful plants, like I mentioned, you get these little tulip-shaped flowers. Uh, since this is a little bit of a smaller tree, they're much easier to notice. Uh, our native one will shoot up with not a branch um, for quite a ways, while this will branch lower. And you can limit up to whatever you want, but on those lower branches, you can see those flowers. And they're smaller than our native. They're about maybe uh, two inches across and two inches deep, but they've really nice uh, orange uh, coloration to them, kind of brighter than the, our native. All right. Let's see. You talk about another magnolia since you're yeah. on a roll with magnolias. Yeah, we seem to have uh, some magnolia theme going on. This is a, another hybrid magnolia. This is serendipity. No, uh, this is uh, Stella Ruby. Oh, okay. And I just as yeah, they look a fair, quite a bit alike in um, in leaf. Um, yeah, Stella Ruby, as you might guess from the name, has a reddish flower. It's not a fire engine red, but it's definitely red um, in late winter. Um, the original plant, or the Arboretum's first plant of this has grown quite quickly over its few years in the ground, so it could also be a useful plant for large hedge or screening plant. It's, I've also seen these types of um, hybrid um, evergreen magnolias grown as a trunk, whereas they get taller, you take the lower limbs off and limb it up. And um, it's really qu quite a beautiful way to display the flowers and the beautiful evergreen foliage. And it is a, a, a much narrower than most of the um, most of the evergreen magnolias that are out there. Really nice form. You know, I don't know. They haven't been around long enough to know if over time they'll widen out significantly more, but young ones really do go um, fairly straight up. Sun to part shade. All right. This Cordata? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so here we have uh, Budlia Cordata. This is a, one of the Mexican tree uh, butterfly bushes. That doesn't sound right. It's a butterfly tree. How's that? Um, Budlia cordata. So it has these great big leaves, real felted square stems. Uh, people will come to your garden and say, what on earth is that? Um, in Mexico, uh, this is grown as a single trunk. It's used as a parking lot tree because it tolerates lots of sun and uh, dry soils. It can get to 80 feet tall. Uh, when I found that out, I immediately said, we got to propagate a bunch and stake them straight up and get some, some good trunks on them and grow them up. It tends to take a little bit of damage, at, at least a little bit of damage in the garden um, to the tops uh, on a, in a cold winter. And so when it dies back, whether it's a co very cold winter and it dies back very low uh, or just kills some of the tips, it'll branch where it does that. And so we have a, a, a shrubby plant. We haven't been able to get one to grow into a tree, really. Uh, so, so think of this as kind of a, a big shrubby plant. But at the, by the same token, you can cut it back hard. Now, it does form its, its flower buds in the, um, uh, oh, it, often it, it, before spring, even if they don't uh, grow out like this, uh, they're mostly formed there. So it flowers late winter um, uh, into spring, depending on, on the weather a bit. Flowers are not showy. They're white and with, you know, the white stems and white leaves and white new growth. They just kind of blend in. So you really are growing this as a foliage plant. But it is a beautiful foliage plant, um, especially as a multi-stemmed uh, uh, shrub. So, um, you know, you get in a spot out with sun and you get a little bit of breeze and you see those backs of those leaves. Um, if you do 
uh, if it does flower, the, the, there are a lot of pollinators that like it. It's, it's generally before a lot of butterflies, but you get a lot of other pollinators who, who like it. Um, you can try growing it as a single um, trunk tree, and maybe the weather has gotten warm enough that you can do that, or you're in a warm enough um, spot. But if you don't want that, it's real easy. You can just cut it back um, as it's coming into growth in the, in the spring um, is generally when I would do it. And deer generally leave uh, butterfly bushes alone. Okay. All right. Okay, all right. Um, this is a selection of our native um, sweet, sweet Betsy or Carolina allspice, a, a, a plant native to probably most of the eastern U.S., um, uh, you know, I've also known people to know, call it sweet bub bubbies or sweet bubbas. Um, when I was a child, we'd pick the flowers and put them in our pockets. Um, this is um, the f how fragrant the flowers are is really variable. Uh, you'll f encounter some that have no fragrance and some that are powerfully fragrant. So this is a selection chosen because the flowers are fragrant. I also noticed that the foliage is a nice, rich green and somewhat glossy. Um, and calicanthus can sometimes be a little bit dull in leaf. So this is an improvement from that standpoint. And in gardens that I've taken care of that were thick with deer, they never bothered the calicanthus. I want to see what the label says in terms of uh uh, the size, okay. Six feet tall, four to five foot wide. Some, yeah. Sometimes these labels are really far off on sizes yeah. of plants, so I, I was just curious if... if... Yeah, six sounds reasonable. I, I would my guess that in time it's a little bit taller, but not tremendously taller. Was that one simply sensational? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great plant, and I agree with you about the foliage on that one. I, I sometimes don't grow calicanthus because the foliage just isn't terribly exciting to me, and that's a, a great one. All right, we got a few different ones here. Um, we have three different witch hazels. Three I'm different witch hazels. I'll talk about two small ones and then give it. A, let okay. you talk about the, the big one. Um, I love witch hazels. Uh, in a lot of northern climates, they're much more heavily used than they are down south because they're one of the few things that will flower uh, in winter. And depending on the type, uh, uh, spring, you know, late fall, win middle of winter, early spring, um, depending on the type. This is a, the Mexican form of our Hamamouse virginiana. This is Hamamouse virginiana variety, subspecies, Mexicana, depends on your, your um, taxonomist of choice. Uh, we've had one growing right outside the front doors of our McSwain Center um, since it was first landscaped. It's getting a little bit um, shaded and crowded now, but every year it just blows me away uh, with the flowering. I, I remember the first time I really noticed it in flower. They're kind of the, the palest flowers I've ever seen um, on a witch hazel, kind of creamy white, but heavy flowering, a lot of texture, a lot of substance to them, and um, uh, much uh, long before our own um, our own native one. There are a couple flower buds already on here, and witch hazels generally flower on old wood, uh, last seasons. Or let me get this right the season before's wood. So wood that is one year completely old. So, you know, next year this will grow again and you would get flower buds on this, uh, this piece uh, right here. So it's, it's one year back. Um, I just, I really think this is, is nice. Um, my understanding, ours isn't growing in a lot of, uh, in a very dry soil, but um, I understand this may be a little more drought tolerant. Uh, Witch hazels are uh, usually grafted, and I think all the ones we have are grafted, so you don't want to let uh, the 
anything grow from below the graft. And that can be more of an issue with witch hazel sometimes than it usually is with th things that like magnolias and dogwoods, which are also grafted. So anything to add on Mexicana? No. Um, Hemimelis virginiana is, is one of the few um, fall blooming shrubs. There are mm -hmm. a lot of things that start sort of in the winter months, but this is at its peak starting almost any moment now. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's early. Um, so this is on the flip side, this is a spring bloomer. This is a Hemimelis vernalis or late winter, early spring, vernal spring. Um, this is one called Lombard's Weeping. Hemimelis vernalis, Lombard's Weeping. And it is a weeping uh, form of uh, witch hazel. And there are a few, there are several different weeping witch hazels. Some of them are very weeping and you really got to work to get them upright. Lombard's weeping really will kind of go up and arch over and it becomes more weeping um, with some age. But as a young plant, it, it's pretty, uh, it does pretty well on its own. If, if I were planting this, I would probably stake it up um, and uh, you know, do that. But um, Easy to grow, uh, sun to part shade. Uh, this has got yellow flowers. I mean, you can kind of, there are flower buds already all over even this young plant. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's a showstopper uh, of a plant, both in form and uh, flower. And Vernalis is generally very fragrant and often has very good fall color. The fol uh, I think the foliage is also notable today for being so, clean and uh, healthy looking. Yeah, and, and early in the spring, it's almost got a blue cast to it. All right, we're, we're running out of time, so we're gonna do a few more. Um, Skylar or Vanna White, after this, if you'll give us the, the flowering one and the banana, and then we'll look at those last few just real quick. Okay, this is one more witch hazel. Uh, this is, uh, uh, Hamamalis intermedia, so the the Asian ones, I believe. Is I thought it was Virginiana. Oh, maybe it is Virginiana. I don't know. It's got oh, a leaf that not... looks like Virginiana. Yeah, I think it's Virginiana. Okay, or, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks. Yeah, um, oh, it's starting to bloom. Yeah. So uh, this is one called Little Prospect. And um, as you can see, uh, it is a variegated form. So whereas most witch hazels kind of fade out a little bit in the. Um, you know, during the summer, and then really the the flowering, that fragrant um, uh, and showy flowering from fall uh, through through uh, late winter is really what they're about. But this one has great foliage on it. Seems this one with the variegation uh, seems to do a little better in some shade. So uh, I'd give it a bit of shade. All right, Doug, you want to talk about this one? Sure. Um, this is a hardy banana. It's not the one that is best known, Musa Baju, but this is uh, Musa sicamensis from Sikkim. Um, it's about the same stature as Musa Baju, um, you know, 10, 12 feet tall or more. A lot of red in the newest foliage um, and one that's been reliably hardy um, uh, through many winters here. Now, if you were the one to buy this this time of year, I'd probably not plant it out until the spring, but you could just store this dry all winter, uh, just treating it like a bulb. The big tuber stem under the ground is very much like a big elephant ear tuber. Yeah, a lot of people take it out and uh, if, if uh, they live somewhere where it's too cold or they get one late in the season like this, throw it in a black plastic bag mm -hmm. and kind of put it in the garage somewhere or something like that. Okay, this one, I am, I really think this is cool. So one day I was visiting the Atlanta Botanic Garden, uh, their Gainesville site, and uh, it was late summer, early fall, and it there was this patch of a toad lily that was just spectacular. It was very kind of upright, but their patch was so big, it, you know, kind of arched over and made this dome. And there was something about the flowers that was different than really anything I had seen besides just being so many. They seemed to be almost a heavier 
texture and a little bit fuzzier than what we typically get. And the foliage looked great, which the foliage of toad lilies often looks terrible by the time they're flowering, which is uh, a real you know, kind of problem because you like that late summer flowering in the shade garden, but you don't want the foliage to look bad. Um, so I asked for a piece and a little bit about it, and they gave me a piece and said it was called um, Fluffy Orchid, which was a good name for that big patch. It, it made sense. Uh, since then, we have been able to find no information about this plant, but it really um, is a showy, showy plant. Uh, I think the best we can tell is it was maybe bred for the cut flower trade, uh, and... Um, a lot of times the cut flower people and the landscape people don't talk to each other. Sometimes their stuff is great cut flowers and terrible landscape plants. Sometimes they're great landscape plants. And this is one that I think is really, really head and shoulders above any of the other ones we do. Yeah, and I might just add that um, when it's well established, it's a good waist height, you know, about three feet tall and a um, good Give strong a grower. But not a uh, rampant spreader. It it's really is a superb toad lily. Okay, I have got some pictures on, on a uh, PowerPoint that Chris will share with you. And I'm just going to, we have these so you can see what size you're getting if you get these. But the images, um, they're images, and Chris will go through them real quick. I'll just talk about them uh, really quick. This is a lily. Doesn't look like much, um, but that's because it's fall and it's going dormant. This is Lilia, Lilium Poilanii. Um, uh, this was, was uh, one collected in Vietnam, and it ranges from, uh, well, all of them, the flower is uh, kind of white with a darker um, center, and it can range from kind of a pale uh, to a really dark burgundy. Um, Chris, I'll talk about all these and then do the PowerPoint. Does that work sure. instead of going back and forth? Um, and when you see it, the, the picture on the right is the original, the clone that this is. This is another Dan Hinckley collection. I have grown this for quite a few years in my own garden. I'm obsessed with species lilies, and a lot of species lilies do not like us at all. But this has been one that has been um, very good for me. Um, flowers pretty late in the season for me. Um, another one, uh, Aristolachia. This is Aristolachia griffithii. This is from Arunachal Pradesh uh, in, in India and um, should prove to be hardy. So Aristolachia are the Dutchman's pipes. Uh, they can have little small, little Dutchman's pipes like um, uh, some of our natives. Uh, this one has a great big one. And um, the, the flower, it comes out and then has this wide, it looks almost like a, a carnivorous plant or something. Um, it can range from dark burgundy to yellow. I didn't have a good picture of a yellow, but the parent plant from this one was one of the yellow ones. And I'm told it should be good and hardy. Um, some of the stuff from India is not so hardy. We have not grown this, um, this uh, collection out, so, uh, you know, Buyer beware a little bit, but um, it, if it has those yellow flowers, um, should be amazing. And good sized flowers. Yeah, bit, yeah, nice big flowers. Okay, I love another group that I'm obsessed with is Polygonatum. This is Polygonatum Mengsensi, another Vietnam collection. Uh, a lot of the woody stuff from Vietnam doesn't do well for us, but some of the, a lot of the herbaceous does. I've been growing this plant, this species, uh, now for about uh, six years, maybe. Um, this one uh, can range, it's got, I don't know if you, how well you can see it, especially against my shirt, but very purple stems. Uh, it, it, unlike the Diasporopsis that, that uh, Doug talked about this is deciduous, so these stems will die. But when it comes out in the spring, some forms of this species will come out almost black purple. And uh, as dark as this stem is, I'm thinking these may, but I don't know that for sure, because um, they can range. Um, nice little white flowers that hang down, followed like by little blue fruits. Like I said, this has been very, very good for me. Um, I think all polygonatums are beautiful, but this is an exceptionally beautiful species. Again, with that bright purple stem and the long 
fairly dark green, um, t long tapered leaves. And this last one is a wild collection of mine from uh, Ime Shan. Uh, this is this is uh, Rainechia carnea, which you know think Loriope, Ophiopogon, kind of a th you know kind of a grassy thing. Um, it will spread to form a nice little gra uh, ground cover, small scale ground cover in shade. Uh, it's much easier to deal with than a Loriope or an Ophiopogon. It, it digs out easy and whatnot. According to some folks doing genetic work, there's really only one species. We grow some that are about four inches tall, and then this is one of the taller ones we grow. In good soil and established, it, it gets um, 18 inches at least. But what's really interesting about this is most of them, you hardly notice that when it's in flower. They have little flowers, they're held under the foliage, and they're usually kind of pinkish uh, colored. Uh, and just, they kind of just disappear. This one that we collected has um, almost pure white flowers. They're white with just a touch of pink. The, the anthers are pink and in there. And between the, the really stark white flowers and this growth habit, which is a little more open than some others, not so dense, it is really showy in flower. And that is, this is the only Rainechia that I have ever said that about, except for maybe the really dwarfest one is, is another one that does well. Yeah. And Thankfully, I did not lose my job the day I told Mark I don't like Rhinecrias, but maybe because I, my, the next word, sentence out of my mouth was, I like this one, <laughs> because it is showy in bloom. The foliage is a bit more interesting than a lot of them. I like the, that it's broad and then tapers. So a lot of them are sort of even width the whole length. So, um, you know, for a carefree plant for shade, um, I think you can't go wrong with this Rhinecchia. We probably need to put a cultivar name on it. Ime Snow. Ime Snow. On my, on my image, it's, it, it's got a name. Oh, okay. So Chris, Perfect. you want to? You wanna... Perfect. Too. Huh? It's in the chat too. Okay. Um, you want to show those slides? I'm trying to get there. All right. And uh, we can answer questions as well if uh, people have them. And I'm going to I'm gonna come over here and yeah. talk about these. Mm. Do I just share this one on the back? Yep. And then... Do I just do this then? Yep. Okay. Uh, it will, it's not the beginning. Oh. Yeah, go back. You had a, uh, a lily that you skipped. Yeah, so um, this is the Lilium poilanii that I showed. The one on the right is the actual, the photo from the actual original collection. Uh, so... This is, like I said, a Dan Hinckley collection. Uh, that Aristolochia griffithii, uh, this is, um, the, you can see the flower, you see that big heart-shaped leaves, great growing up through a tree, uh, something like that. Um, pipe vine swallowtails will come to it. Uh, as far as I know, they are, um, they'll, they'll feed on every, uh, Aristolochia that's out there. The the photo on the left is closer to the the yellow that the parent plant was, but you never know with seedlings what you're going to get. Um, this is that polygonatum that I showed, um, showing it in uh, kind of spring, late summer, and you can see how dark that uh, foliage is. And uh, the Rainechia, and it, it really is a nice plant. Uh, everybody who sees it really, who, who knows Rainechia, really remarks on how, how different it is. Uh, just a couple little things, like I have three or four more that we didn't have pictures of that I want to show. A great fern, this is a fern for more sun, well-drained soil. This is the hairy lip fern. Used to be known as Chilanthes, but they have pushed all the American Chilanthes into a new genus. Uh, now, fair warning again, this is a southern hemisphere plant that might be difficult to grow. Um, it's in the sale partially because I love it so much and I keep um, planting it. I have a good one going at home right now, uh, but I'd put it this uh, barberry in a little bit of of afternoon shade, a little bit cooler spot if you have it. Berberus darwinii, and it's got these just rich, rich orange flowers, and is a small plant with um, 
small little holly-like leaves, but they're real small leaves. Uh, we do have a, um, a wild collected uh, Hedicium gardnerianum. This is a picture of that clone in flower. Dan Hinckley collected this in India. Uh, this is that same um, plant growing in his garden. Uh, just, if you look, this uh, flag right here, this Tibetan prayer flag, that's a prayer flag for JC. Oh, uh, and I believe this one or this one's from Peter Wharton at the university, who was at the uh, University of British Columbia Botanic Garden. But very fragrant in the evening. And uh, I was really glad to be able to bring this in. This is a uh, uh, Schefflera uh, alpina. Uh, some of the species of Schefflerias are very tough in our area. This has not gone through a cold winter, um, but it has gone through multiple summers at my house. And the Schefflera alpina that we are have in the sale is this same clone. I've grow, I have two of them that have been outside for several years in my garden. Um, I'm hoping to get seed on mine this year because it is flowering well and has actually finished flowering um, some of them. So hopefully uh, if you put it in a protected spot and we don't get a super cold winter, uh, it'll do well. But heat, the heat tolerance has been remarkable on it because it's a high elevation um, plant. And that is it. Uh, so if you want to do this, stop share. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. So I took care of the few questions that were in the chat earlier. So if you have a new question, go ahead and ask it in the chat or just turn your microphone on and we can hear you over here. We lost them. Okay. All right, everybody, um, really uh, do hope uh, that, um, that you look at our plant list. It's going to be a fantastic one. Like I said, uh, when it first goes up, we'll still have some things that will be added as we go. Um, often we're adding plants up until, uh, you know, getting close to, you know, three or four days before we close. Um, sometimes that's because we get plants in late. We don't... Uh, some of the plants that we bring in from other places, we don't like to put in the sale, uh, you know, before we really get them confirmed and we're comfortable um, selling those. Uh, some of the plants that will go into the sale late will be things that uh, Doug will be back in the nursery and he'll say, he'll think, hey, you know, that would be a good plant for the sale. We have a few extra. We only need a, some for the the garden, and so we'll we'll add a few things like that in. Um, you just never know, but sometimes it's the choicest stuff that doesn't come in till late. So so keep looking back at it, and if you are within you know several hundred miles, it is worth coming out here uh, for to pick up your plants because uh, it's yeah you know, it's a lovely garden if i do say so myself so you can come out you can pick up your plants um and then you can uh visit some of the other great gardens around here if if picking up these plants makes you feel really good you can talk to us about some other great gardens and great nurseries to visit around here there are some nurseries where you can get some cool plants at, at some really good prices too so um hope you'll do that there's no more questions in the chat, a lot of kudos, but a couple people have unmuted the microphone. So uh, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it right now. What was the Japanese hydra uh, hydrangea? That was uh, Dichroa uh, febrifuga. The one I showed was Yamaguchi white. We also have one that we're just calling heavy fruiting because it came out of a population of, of very heavy fruiting forms. Uh, so um, both of those, and we, we don't have any other ones in. The, I don't think so. There are some other species that are out there and there are some, some other selections that we sometimes offer. Also the Japanese dogwood. Y the um, Cornus Kusa is sometimes called Korean dogwood, um, and that, but it does grow from Japan all the way, Korea and China. Um, that was... Um, was it Snow Tower? Snow, Snow Tower, Tower, thank you. That's right. Um, Cornus Kusa Snow Tower. Just had a question. Sue's Su Su asked... What uh, kind of full party do you think that Mexican Budlia is? Well, I have been here for 15 years. 
uh, 14 years, excuse me. And uh, it was here before I got here. So very hardy. It has been killed back to the ground multiple times, but has always come back. I think with a very young plant, um, you know, if you plant it out this fall, uh, I would, you know, if the temperatures are going to get really cold, I'd give it some good mulch. Um, the top I wouldn't be too worried about, but I would, I would mulch it pretty deeply, um, especially this first year and maybe another year if it looks like it's going to get cold. And then I would pull that mulch back um, when you, you come out of spring. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Sue is wondering, do deer eat witch hazel? I would imagine some of them do. Uh, yes, they do. Um, but as with a lot of trees and shrubs, if you protect them until they're tall enough so they're above browse level, you could solve that problem that way. Thank you, Doug. Um, Beth has asked, does the uh, redbud wave crest tolerate a windy condition? I would I would say so. Um, we haven't been growing it for a super long time, but it's um, it's got a, a, just a really thick textured leaf uh, that I think it, you know a windy location wouldn't kill it anyway. But they can you know kind of make the leaves look a little ratty on on some of them. But I, I really don't think that it will for this because it's such a thick textured leaf and um, they're they're fairly small leaves from the chinensis parent. So. I think that'd be fine. And the last question in the chat, Diane just asked, do rabbits eat toad lilies? Rabbits yes. don't eat anything in my garden. They just bite it off and then leave it on the ground to spite me. <laughs> um, so yeah, the but, answer would be yes. Yeah. You know, use a repellent on them, buy some milorganite and sprinkle it around them. Well, that's it for the uh, chat questions. Anyone else with a, with a remaining question want to ask it live? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you for- Does the sound run daily between the upper members starting on the 7th and then to the general public on the 13th? Yeah, so um, the sale will will start on the 7th at noon and it will it will run through uh, the, what is it, the last date? And was it 18th? I, no. can, I can never remember the, the dates for these things. I told a bunch of it people the, that it, I don't have my calendar. 13th, I believe. 13th is the day that it goes live to so, the public. So it starts on the 8th at noon. On the 13th at noon, it go, It opens up to everybody. All, we try to have all the plants up by then so that our members have early access to all the plants. So on Monday, uh, the 12th, I'd check the, the site if you want to make sure we have everything. And we really try not to add much after that. We, we can't help ourselves, though. We just love plants so much. We love getting them out there. Catherine um, just confirmed that it closes on October 18th. That's a Monday, and it closes at noon. So all times are at noon. And just so everybody knows, the way this will work is we will do all, we'll do all the sales. Um, it's first come, first serve for sales. So if you're the first person, you're going to get everything you order, unless there's a crop failure or something, which occasionally happens. Um, but we won't have pickup right away. We, you will, when it closes on the 18th, shortly after that, um, within, the, within a, a day or two, you will get an email with a link to sign up for a day to pick up. Not, not a time but uh, a day, maybe morning, afternoon, that kind of thing. Um, and then you can come out anytime on that day and to pick up your plants. Uh, it's just, uh, we find that to be you know, an, an easier way to do that. And um, we get so many people purchasing from the sale that it's, it's hard to arrange it some other way. But we hope that you will come out, um, pick a day that you have some time, you'll come out, you'll wander the garden, you'll see some cool things and, um, and pick up your plants. Um, and just a quick reminder, this is a pre-order plant sale, and it's also conducted online. So it's not going to be an on-site program. It's all done online. Yeah, I, I think the point Chris made needed to be made because the question was, does the sale run daily? It runs 24 hours a day, and but it's only online. You do not come to the Arboretum and shop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of us have trouble with computers. You can contact the Arboretum and somebody could probably help you 
you know, gain access to the site if you fail to manage that? We, we will have a, a link that you can get in touch with, um, that you can reach out to, that we'll be monitoring, that will help, that we can help you walk through it, um, whatever. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, no, no more questions in the chat and no more live questions. So thank you every mu everyone for coming out today and enjoying the program. Thanks to Mark and Doug for presenting it. And then thanks, of course, to Alexander, Carol, and Skylar for helping out with today's program. See you all next week. Thank and you. like and subscribe.